That's a good woman right there. Amen. The boys are at her dad's. Took them up there yesterday afternoon. And they'll be there till Friday night, I think. Amen. So it's just me and mom at the house. Hallelujah. Amen. So love her very much. Amen. Job chapter 8, verse 11. Can the rush grow up without mire? Can the flag grow without water? Whilst it is yet in his greenness and not cut down, it wherewith before any other herb. So are the paths of all that forget God. The hypocrite's hope shall perish. Whose hope shall be cut off and whose trust shall be a spider's web. He shall lean upon his house and it shall not stand. He shall hold it fast, but it shall not endure. He is green before the sun and his branch shooting forth in his garden. His roots are wrapped up by the heat, uh, wrapped about the heap, and seeth the place of stones. If he destroy him from his place, then it shall deny him, saying, I have not seen thee. Behold, this is the joy of his way. Out of the earth shall others grow. Amen. From Job we read, and I hadn't read Job in a long time. This jumped out at me. I want to talk to you. Amen. Can the rush grow without the mire? Look at somebody and say, can you grow without mire? Mire's mud. Look at somebody and say, can you grow without the mud? Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. We want to talk to you. You can be seated. May not be real long. These aren't a lot of notes, but just want to talk to you. The word mire here is uh, bitsa. It means swamp, mire, the marsh. Comes from a word that is boats, B-O-T-S-E, which is mud or whitish clay. The flag is a marshy grass or where we get the word reeds, reeds. This passage was has all the appearance of being a fragment of of a poem that had been handed down from ancient times. It is spoken by Bildad as an example of the views of the ancients and as the connection would seem to imply as a specimen of those who lived before the life of man being abridged. It was customary in the early ages of the world to communicate knowledge of all kinds by maxims, moral sayings, proverbs, and by apothegms. A short, concise saying that is instructive, cleanliness is next to godliness. Have you ever heard that? Cleanliness is next to godliness. It's an adage. It's a metaphorical saying. It's like the early bird gets the worm. Amen. My dad, you say that all the time. Amen. We get to church, we're going to be early because the early bird gets the worm. And it was kind of a thing back in the 70s, even though it was financially tight, we'd all wonder uh, when church is over, we were going to go out and eat, and everybody would be going out to eat. Dad, we going out to eat? Yeah, we're going. Where are we going, Dad? 1120 South, 72nd. Oh, Dad. Home address. Most of the time, we'd go home. So he always would use that as a metaphoric saying, amen. The early bird gets the worm, and amen. Bill Dad was... Uh, his name means a son of contention. He is the second of Job's three miserable comforters. Many of the things spoken by Bildad, the son of contention, were totally false and doctrinally impure. But the words spoken here are inspired and recited from ancient poets and sages and therefore they were true. Look at the context in which this is uttered. Job is in the throes of a test and a trial. It's the trial of his faith. Now, I thought about going through all that, but I think most of you know about Job's trial and how that uh, God began to ask him a question and Job answered the question and back and forth and all of a sudden Job ends up in a trial. It all began when Satan 
came before God and God asked him, have you considered my servant Job? This life test is actually the result of a disagreement between God and Satan. Satan's opinion, look at someone say Satan's opinion, of us is that we only serve God for the blessings, for the boom shakalaka money miracles. I got news for him. I, I live for him because I love him, but you know, them blessings sure do help. Amen. Amen. And uh, But if they're stopped or taken away, Satan's opinion is we will curse God. That's what Satan thinks. God's opinion, he won't curse you. He won't curse me. But he will bless me like he always has. No, he won't. Yes, he will. No, he won't. Yes, he will. No, he won't. Yes, he will. Back and forth and back and forth. And finally... God unleashes the first test. Can I say, in our living and in our life, and the older I get, the more I see it, amen, you just never know what's going to come up on you day by day. You never know the test. You know, never know the trial. You never know. And you can be feeling great, and all of a sudden, boom, got COVID. Boom, you got kidney stones. Lord, that hit me in my head. That hurt me. I've had over 100 of them, about 122 if I remember correctly. The last one was just three years ago. I mean, had had one that passed. I had to go up in there and get it. And when they were taking the x-rays, they found three more, big as into my thumb. Three of them, that's the biggest ones I've ever had. So I knew they wasn't going up in there to get that, but they had to do the ultrasound and put that on there and blow them up. And they blew all three of them up and, Doctor said, man, he said, they were all right together and we hit it perfect. He said, I mean, he said, you should be passing powder in the next day or so. And sure enough, it was just powder. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Y'all ain't saying nothing because you ain't ever had a kidney stone. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. Anybody else ever had a kidney stone? Come on, hands up. One, two, three, four, five of us. Oh, then we'll make you sing high tenor. Them things hurt, brother, I'm telling you. Amen. I was in, first one I went in, there was a woman doctor, and she told me she got me, finally got me shot, a couple of different shots, finally got the pain shut down, and I was kind of hanging in there. She said, it's all right, Reverend. I said, what's well, all right? She said, I've had one, and I tell you, they're horrible. She said, it's the worst thing ever. I said, you had one? She said, yeah, I don't ever want another one. So there. But anyway, it made me feel better because I was squealing and squawking and Lord have mercy. But ever since then, it's just been a continual flow up. Until the last three years after that surgery, I hadn't had no pain and thank God for it. Amen. But test number one for Job was the loss of his cattle and donkeys and all of his animals was his finances and his wealth because he was the richest man in all the East. But the key was he was a worshiper. He feared God. Was only in holy awe of and had respect or reverential respect for God. He offered up sacrifices daily, not only for himself but for his children. He, he would pray extra prayers and offer up extra blood sacrifices just in case the kids forgot. Look at somebody and tell me, ain't nothing changed. You got kids, you got to pray extra for them. Come on, somebody. Hey, Boshai. Amen. So it is oftentimes that the result that more is that the more blessed we are, most times, and I'm trying not to be an evangelist and I'm trying to teach, so that's why I'm going slow. <laughs> oftentimes the result that the more blessed we are, normally, the less we worship, the more blessed we are. The less we worship, the less we pray, the less we consecrate, the less we give, the less we tithe, and the less we attend church, the more blessed we are. Look at somebody just say amen. Because if you stay quiet, I just hunker down there and dig that one up. Amen. Amen. But it's true. Amen. Most of the time, people start getting blessed and all of a sudden, I'm just too busy. I can't make it to church and I love telling the story about Brother Tommy Wallace at Columbia, Mississippi. I went and preached there. 
many years ago, the first time I went to Brother Carney's church and Vandas and preachers heard I was going. They said, hey, Brother Carney, how you doing? Doing good. Hey, I heard you going to Brother Carney's. I said, yeah, how'd you hear it? Oh, it don't matter. I just heard it. I said, yeah, I'm, I get to go to Brother Carney's. He said, man, look. He said, there's a rich man in that church. And the word is, if you just call him out and prophesy over him, he said, he'll bless you a new truck, bless you a new trailer. Man, he gave one guy $10,000. And I, I got nervous. I mean, I was like, and he said, you're awful quiet. I said, what are you saying? I kind of got a little mad at him. Oh, I'm not saying that. No, I said, no, what'd you say? Well, you know, I just want you to know he's there. And if you feel something, I said, you know what? You, just, you best just leave this alone here. And I hung up on him. Because I was raised in the, my pastor, Brother Whaler in Oklahoma City. I mean, there was just a holy awe about uh, the gifts of the Spirit, prophesying and tongues and interpretation and working of miracles and all that kind of stuff. I mean, man, if that happened, if we had a preacher in that that was known to happen when they preached, it was like a holy uh, man walked in, buddy. I mean, everybody was nervous and, you know, but just to get up and just wing it out there and just try to get you something out of it. And so, I mean, I just wasn't going to do it. I called my bishop and called a couple of my elders and they said, don't you do it. I said, I'm not going to do it. I just want you to know who said it just in case you hear anything, but I ain't saying nothing to him. Don't know who Brother Wallace is anyway. So I was there about two and a half, three weeks. I was in church and I was in the office and getting ready to start service tonight. Brother Carney said, hey, you know, brother, you, have you met Brother Wallace? I said, no, sir, I haven't. He said, I said, no, I haven't met him. He, would you like to meet him? I said, that, that's up to you. I may have shook his hand. He didn't introduce himself. I don't know. He said, well, yeah, let me hang on. So he caught the phone. Hey, Tom, come on. Come to the office. I want you to meet the evangelist. About five minutes, knock at the door. He said, Brother God, get, well, open that door. But the Carney had a great big office. He said, go open the door. And I walked open the door and pulled the door. When I see him, I went, there ain't no way. Brother Carney started laughing. He said, that is not Tommy Wallace. Brother Wallace was hugged, laughing and grabbed me and hugged me. He said, yeah, I am. He hugged me. I said, this can't be Brother Wallace. Brother Carney said, what are you talking about? I said, there ain't no way this man is the richest man in Southern Pentecost. Got all the money they say he is. And look at him. He's just casual dressed, just normal looking. And this man, I'm running through my mind, this man runs the aisles, ever service. This man dances up and down the aisles in church. This man lays hands on people all in the altar. And last Sunday night, Bishop, you had two broke arms fell off the back of his truck hunting. He took off too quick and he had his gun in his, in his hands and he fell off the truck and didn't let go of his gun to land on his elbows, broke his elbows. So there he is in slings, goes in the prayer room and they're in there about 15, 20 minutes. All of a sudden a big noise, I turn and look. They come through the side door. Brother Wallace come through the door whistling everybody, hey, God's healed, Brother Carney. Brother Carney come out waving his arms, slings off. Place blew up. I didn't have to preach that night. We had eight or nine, got the Holy Ghost. It was crazy. I said, there ain't no way you are that rich man. Look at somebody and say, can you stand to be blessed? Why is it the more blessed we get, the less we do? The less we pray, the less we worship. I think I hit something in here. Amen. Look at somebody, I can stand to bless him. Tell somebody, I can stand to bless him. Now, here's what I'm saying. I had no intention of getting here, but I'm here and you're quiet. So my rules are, if you get quiet, I just stay there. So the best thing to do is just fake it and say amen, even if it hurts. Just make me keep going. Hallelujah. But God is in the blessing business. Amen. And I would say the more blessed you are, the more you ought to be glad to give God praise. Especially when you come to church. Brother Wallace told me, he said, but God, I just made my mind that the Lord, the more God blesses me, the more I'm going to worship it, the more I'm going to run the aisles, the more I'm going to work the altars, the more I'm going to go to the prayer room. I'm going to, the, the more he blesses me, the wilder I'm going to get. I mean, now he was up about 67, 68 then, and he'd get out now and he'd do it like this. I mean, he'd be out there all by himself. And they had seven, 800 people in there. He'd be out there just worshiping. There were two or three other millionaires in there. They didn't worship like he did. They did pretty good. They gave a little hand wave. 
Aren't you glad you're not going to hell? Tell somebody that amen will keep us out of trouble now. Tell somebody you need to say amen. You know, we got that little Pentecostal. Revival pushes over, so now 30 days, Brother Smith's here. You know, you got to come on now, Brother Smith. Be all over if we don't work. Ha ha! He leaves the fifth Sunday. Whoa, shuts down. There's got to be something in us. Like Job. Amen. He just, he just made his mind up. I ain't going to quit. I'm not going to quit worshiping. I'm not going to quit giving. I'm not going to quit being what I am. I'm the richest man in all the least, but I'm going to keep on keeping on. I ain't going to stop doing what I'm doing. Look at somebody say, you can't stop. So the question is, can you stand to be blessed? We see Job after having lost his wealth and family members and all of his servants, but one from each test, he lost all of his animals. And we see Job worshiping anyway. Hell thinks we will stop in the test and the trial, but God says they will keep worshiping me because they love me for me and not for what I do for them. The real test of worship has nothing to do with whether things are going on good, whether things are going great in my life, whether everybody loves me. The real test of worship is, amen, I love God and he loves me and I'm going to give him some praise. Somebody say amen. So then second test comes up, it's skin for skin, says Satan. You let me touch his body and his flesh. Let me, let me attack his health. And he'll curse you then. So I said, all right. Go ahead. Boils appear all over his body. They become pus oozing. The stink of the spoiling, rotting flesh running sores. Now his friends become, as the Bible calls them, miserable comforters. And then his wife becomes a mouthpiece of Hale's opinion. She walks in, why don't you just curse God and die? Job responded, you speak like a foolish woman. Naked came I into this world, and naked shall I return hither. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. This is, this is Job. I mean, he's tore up from the now. He doesn't realize it. God and Satan been having this conversation about him. He can't take it. No, he can take it. No, he can't. Yes, he can. No, he can't. Yes, he can't. No, he can't. Yes, he can. No, he can't. Yes, he can. They were fussing. God said, All right, go ahead. Makes it through the first test. He keep, keep blessing God. Now he gets to where he touches his flesh. He's, I mean, he's just, he's tearing him up from the floor up. But God told him, the only thing you can't do is you can't kill him. So he says, that's all right, he's going to cuss you out. But at the end of the test, when his wife even turned on him, he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord, now he's there. You got to see him now. He's weak. He's got oozing pus sores all over his body. And he's saying, The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm trying to help somebody here today. And I didn't know really why I'm on this, but I do now. 
I want you to know that it doesn't matter how bad the test gets. Just remember, it's a fuss going on between heaven and hell. And I may be the one, you may be the one that's in the microscope now. Hell's watching and all of heaven's watching. And all you've got to remember to do is you bless the Lord at all times. Let his praise be continually on your mouth. Come on, somebody. Come on, lift your hands and give him praise. Come on, somebody needs to praise him now. You need to go ahead and love him. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. There's, I, I don't understand, but I love you anyway, God. I, I, I don't understand why it's going on, but I love you anyway, God. I praise you anyway. So the text comes up, the rush. It's the papyrus reed that grows along the Nile River. And it was extremely versatile in its uses. Rushes were used to weave together cloths. The roots were dried and used for fuel. They were used to weave together sails for the ships. The merchants could carry their wares over the seas for employment. The hungry were fed by feeding from the plant. The inner piece was dried and cut into strips to make papyrus scrolls. By referring Job's mind to the rush, he would have well understood the reference to the rush as a building block for the then known civilization. The papyrus reed was absolutely necessary element in the growing of a cultured society. Civilization could not exist without the reed for it even recorded the information of the sages for future knowledge and learning. Even the Bible was written with the reed on the papyrus scroll. So to Job, the reed could only grow from the swamp or the marsh. That's the place it grew. Behold, this is the day, this is the joy of his way. And he said, out of the earth, others shall grow. Now this is the whole message. What the Lord wants somebody to understand today is is that it's out of the marsh, out of the mire, out of the mud. That's where we grow from. I hadn't been around here in a couple of months, so I don't really know what's going on. But I just feel like telling somebody, if you're in a muddy situation, the best thing you can do is praise God out of the mud. Come on, if you got a muddy situation in your life, we don't have no music, we didn't even have a piano player or a drummer, we had to get recorded music to play over the PA. They were worried about it, but I think they did great tonight. But I want to tell you, everything may not be perfect servicely tonight, but I've come to tell you, if you got a muddy situation in your life right now, just hang on. Because out of the rush, out of the mire is where the rush grows. Out of the tough times is where we really grow. This is why I say all the time, I'm going to say it here, popped in my head. This is why the greatest praisers and worshipers are the people that are going through stuff. I, I, I never get amens hardly ever anywhere. I say, well, I don't, I don't believe that. You just watch yourself. Little tough times come. And you come in church, you don't give a flip about what somebody thinks about your praise. Now, you're trying to keep your cover. You don't want to blow because, you know, Pentecostals, man, they just get them. Man, you know what happened to him? They'd be on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and they'd be talking about you. Amen. Here's what I'm trying to say to you. The more blessed we are, the more we should praise him anyhow. But most of the time, most of the time, most of the time, People that give God the most praise and worship are the folks that are going through something 
and it's so bad, you don't care what anybody says about you. I'm going to bless the name of the Lord at all times, anyhow. So, I don't know. I'm just kind of waiting on the Lord now. I don't know if it's some of y'all still haven't got your house all straightened out. I don't know if you're okay. Okay. But you know what? You're worshiping. You're here worshiping. You're positive tonight talking to me. And I've come to encourage you. You keep on praising God in spite of the mire. Come on, look at somebody and say, I'm going to praise God anyhow. I'm going to praise God in spite of what's going on. Come on, somebody. Amen. I'm going to bless the name of the Lord at all times. That's what the book says. You got to bless the Lord at all times. Tell somebody at all times. I'm going to, you know why? Because it's when we get down, the devil attacks and says, where's your God? Why isn't this going on? Why is this happening? But you've got enough sense to know, hey, it don't matter. Blessed I came in. Blessed I'm going out. But blessed be the name of the Lord anyhow. It has nothing to do with what's going on. The name of the Lord is to be praised. Come on, stand with me. Stand with me. Well, my friends, friends may have left you. Hey, now you be friendly. Don't, don't try to drive somebody out. But if they're going to leave you because you keep coming to church and they don't like you because you're growing in Christ and they're making fun of you because you're not drinking with them anymore and you're not doing drugs with them anymore, you know what? Let them yakety yak themselves right out the door. Because you need them like you need a heart attack. Look at somebody and say, hey, I don't need no heart attack. Amen. Is everybody with me? Amen. So I don't know. I hadn't been, and my wife doesn't, I mean, we don't ever talk about church other than just our own talk. I mean, she, don't, she don't gossip. She don't tell me what's going on here. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. It may not be anything. It may be preventative maintenance. Changing oil at 3,000 miles instead of 7,500 just to be safe. <laughs> At the end of Job's life, do you remember this? He had lost all of his service but one at each of those stations. His three comforters, his three best buddies, began to tell him, you need to curse God. So he lost his best friends. Now he's developed this. He don't know what's going on. He don't know God and the devil have been talking about him. He doesn't know that this whole test is about God's opinion and the devil's opinion. So can I tell you? The test is not about you. It's about an opinion that's being discussed between heaven and hell. They'll quit if they lose their house. They'll quit if you let it flood. It's been almost a year now, and if you'll keep them out of that, they're going to throw the white flag up the pole. They're going to surrender and quit. But I've come to tell somebody, if you'll praise God through it, even in the muddy places of life, anybody can praise God when you're getting raises and get fancy new cars. Thank God for all of it. But when you get in the mire, when it gets muddy, the papyrus reed grew from the mud. And I read to you the list of things that they used the papyrus reed for. Can I tell you? When you become likened to the papyrus reed, just know this. They used the papyrus reed for everything making baskets fuel even use the inner pith as dried and cut into strips to make the papyrus scroll so they can record history and write on it some of the most valuable things that society needed then grew in the muddy swamps 
And when Job's life was all done, the Bible says, everything was doubled back to Job. Everything he lost, it came back double. Why? Because he didn't curse God foolishly like the devil thought. He just kept blessing the Lord. Blessing the Lord through losing his cattle. Bless the Lord through losing all of his family. Bless the Lord. His wife telling him to cuss God out. And he just kept blessing the Lord. He got boils on his body. He just kept blessing the Lord. But when it was all done, you know, I, I remember looking at this and I was trying to figure out how long this test went. I've heard a few years, but the most popular opinion on how long Job's problem lasted was six to eight months. So now you take all that stuff happening to him in six to eight months. That's all hell breaking loose on you. I mean, now you go back and read the first couple chapters of Job and look at all that stuff he went through in, say, six months. That'll make you go shando. That'll give you stammering signs right there. So six or eight months or eight or ten years, whatever it was, when it was finished, God said, all right. Are you settled now, devil? All right. He took it. And when it was all done, this was a disagreement between God and the devil. And God had an opinion about Job. He said, he ain't going to cuss me out. Can I say one more time? To people that are going through, you keep coming to church, you're faithful. Keep paying your tithes, living for God, but there's no blessing. You keep giving for God, but there's just no victory. You just keep blessing God anyhow, and nothing's happening. Just keep doing it because it won't be long. The devil's going to run the white flag up the pole. I say, okay, God, Job took it. He's, I mean, you won't let me kill him, and he's doing everything's all right. I guess you're right. And the Bible says everything was doubled back. Come on, look at somebody and tell them when this trial's over. I'm going to get double for my trouble. Glory. Amen, amen, amen. Would you turn around and grab hands with somebody? Move down the aisle. Grab a hand with them. Step across the aisle. Grab somebody's hand. Stay with me. I'm not going to make you come to the altar. I know you worked hard all day. Walk an extra 10 feet to just about kill you. I want you to lift that neighbor's hand and I want you to pray with them. I want you to thank God for the fact that they're still in church and in spite of everything they may be going through, God, we're still here. We believe you're going to bless us. We're going to keep paying our tithes, keep paying our offering. We're going to keep inviting people to church. We're going to keep coming to church. We're going to keep responding to the preaching. We're going to keep responding to the teaching. We're going to be faithful. We're going to stay with it, God, because we know it may get muddy and swampy, but we can make it. And we know it's probably a disagreement between you and the devil. But devil, I want you to know I'm not going to cuss God. I'm not going to throw the white flag up. I'm not going to backslide over this. I'm going to hang in there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I bless your name anyhow, Lord. I bless your name anyways. You're a good God. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. I was there preaching during that revival at Brother Carney's. One Sunday night, Brother Wallace come walking up out of that congregation, 700, 800 people just walked right up on the platform. Walked right up to Brother Carney. Brother Carney, they were brother-in-laws too. Brother Carney said, what, what you want? He said, I need to pull up here for just a minute. And he said, what? He said, just a minute. Brother Carney said, okay. Walked up there and started talking about Brother Carney and bragging on him how good he was. Thankful for how much he loved the church and how the church had blessed him. And We've got an indebtedness here at the church. It's three million and something dollars and we just had a big contract we got building roads I forget where it was he said 
we got that and got it all finished. And he said, I got the check. And he said, I'm here to pay my tithes on what I got. But Carney looked. He said, Brother Carney, here you go. But Carney's like, what in the world? He looked three million plus dollars to Woodlawn Church. It paid off their debt. They were debt free. Come on, somebody. Come on, you need to look at your neighbor and say, you just don't know how you're about to be blessed. You may be going through something right now, but just keep on pushing. Just keep on working. Just keep on believing. Keep on paying your tithes. It won't be long, and the devil's going to surrender and say, okay, I'm done for a little while. I'm done for a little while. Amen. Amen. The devil even met God manifested in flesh in the wilderness when God inhabited a human body. His omnipotence, his omniscience, his omnipresence was in that body and yet it was still everywhere else around the earth. The devil said he's got flesh on him. I bet I can get him. And tried for 40 days to get him to cuss God. And he wouldn't do it. And when it was over, the Bible says, Satan said, I'm going to leave you for a while. I'll be back. I believe the next time was at Calvary. He thought he could get him. But look at somebody but, and tell them, say, when you've made your mind up, you're not going to quit. Tell somebody, don't run the flag up the pole and quit. You'll hang in there. I mean, Jesus hadn't ate for 40 days. I was listening today on, on a, a tape on today, and they were talking about somebody lasted, fasted 40 days, and they lost 60 pounds in 40 days. So now can you see Jesus maybe been 185, 190? He lost 45, 50 pounds. He's down to 140. And the Bible said he walked into that service, and when he went into that church, right out of that, out of that temptation, he walked into church and there was a man sitting in their church that was possessed of the devil. And when Jesus walked in, them devil spoke out of that man and said, Leave us alone. I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. He didn't stop me eating dinner. He didn't eat breakfast. He went from the desert right into church. Lost 40, 50 pounds. Weak as he could be. And the devil, as soon as he walked into church, somebody possessed of the devil devil screamed at him leave us alone what are you trying to say I'm trying to tell you when you're going through it when you're at your weakest point you're stronger than any devil look at somebody and say I'm stronger than any devil even at my weakest point look at somebody and say he's done stand with me let's lift our hands again Come on, give him some praise. You're still in church. You're still at church. You still love God. You still love your brothers and sisters. You still love the church. You still love the truth. You're thankful your name's written down. You're on your way to heaven. But you may be going through some stuff. I've come tell you, hang on. There's some good going to come out of this stuff. I said there's some good going to come out of it. Amen, amen, amen. Well, look at somebody and say, amen, amen. Tell somebody, brother, Godwin loves you. Amen. Tell them the bishop, Sartan, loves them. Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Make sure you greet your friend, buddy. Greet your friends. Greet your neighbors. Greet our guests. We'll see you back here Sunday morning in Jesus' name, ready for church. Remember to hand out cards. Leave them someplace. Invite people to church. And watch God bless you anyhow.